I'll introduce you to Aaron Ra now. Aaron Ra is the, is the Texas State Director of American Atheists. He is an atheist video blogger and an activist. Aaron was raised in an exclusively creationist environment, but challenged this at a very early age. Not only his family, but his babysitters tried to indoctrinate him. One babysitter ended up shouting at him, how dare you question God? Aaron challenges the myths of creationism with facts. He has made a 17 part series of videos which addresses the most popular claims of creationists. The series is highly critical of the methods employed by creationists, describing the ringleaders as liars. Some have a financial interest in the benefits, the beliefs they're pushing. The series is aimed at the general public so that they can understand what science is and use this to challenge creationist misinformation. Aaron makes educational science videos with Lilandra that are entertaining and informative and which appeal to people who aren't scientists. He produces a living science series of videos, bite-sized science pieces for adults and children. He was drawn into activism and challenging the education system when the religious right dominated his state's board of education. They began undermining education in history, health, science and social studies. Here in Ireland, we can understand only too well how religion can dominate the state curriculum. Last November, the Texas State Board of Education voted to accept controversial social studies textbooks representing Moses as a founding father and his influence on the American Constitution. Last year, Aaron appeared before the State Board of Education to speak against the contentions in the textbooks regarding Moses and argue that the Ten Commandments were not influential on the laws of the land. He will speak today um, about those challenges and um, he will discuss how it's the ongoing problems that they're having there. One of our biggest campaigns in Atheist Ireland is challenging the education system and the religious influence on that system. Given our education system, there is no legal impediment here in Ireland that would stop the state funding a school that integrates creationism into the state curriculum. It is all ahead of us. We are looking forward to hearing Aaron speak about his experiences on the ground in campaigning to remove the harm that religious co religion causes in education. <coughs> Please give a warm welcome to Aaron Rao. Thank you everybody for showing up. It's, uh, it's always encouraging when the room fills up like this and they had to bring out other chairs. That was great. Uh, bear with me just a minute while I get this thing set up. It's gone to sleep on me. Okay. I hate Windows 8. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, that's something else I was going to say before I started. I can't remember what. It, don't you hate when that happens? Especially when you got a room full of people. All right. There, uh, there's an old Jesuit saying that. Uh, here we go. Give me the child until he is seven, and I will show you the man. And this, of course, refers to how susceptible young children are to religious and cultural uh, conditioning. When we're very young, we're capable of learning far more and much faster than at any other time in our lives. Those who take advantage of this information absorbency have shown that it is possible for toddlers to learn multiple languages and accelerate into advanced mathematics even before other kids find out about multiplication tables. However, most kids get uh, no formal education until after the learning curve has waned and what they get after that is usually inadequate for first world nations. What we're taught and how we're taught during that formative period can have a profound impact on who we are and how we think forever afterward. And that has a stifling effect by design. There are studies I could cite which imply that religious biases can impede cognition and recognition, attention and perception, that atrophy of one area of the brain uh, in elderly people has been linked to depression, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease, and the same diminished capacity has also been associated with religious experiences, including the notion of being reborn. 
According to another study, the belief that one has a relationship with God is associated with the reptilian brain, while experiencing the fear of God is associated with a reduction in another area of the brain, but an increase in that same area of the brain has been associated with pragmatism. Not only the quest for truth, but also a rejection of the belief in gods. And according to another study, there is also links between the brain's dopamine production and religious experience, belief, and behavior. This was suggested by several lines of evidence, including the fact that a variety of clinical conditions related to dopaminergic dysfunction, things like mania, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, and temporal lobe epilepsy, are regularly associated with hyper-religiosity. And if you find it significant that the same regions of the brain correlated to religiosity are also correlated to schizophrenia, this same study promotes LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, DMT, and ecstasy as especially potent drivers of religious experience. <laughs> this is not to say that religion can be cured with Thorazine, although maybe in some cases. <laughs> I don't really know how conclusive these stories are. I cite them only because they give me a chuckle. What I can say for certain is that there is no demonstrable truth to any religious claim. They're either not evidently true, or they're evidently not true. And there's a lot about religion that we can show to be false, and nothing fails like prayer. But uh, with regard to the effect of education on intelligence, I seriously think that the clearest way to regard the, uh, um, or to know the detrimental effects of generations of being subjected to religious indoctrination, one need only look at the current American political situation as a result of that. I'm so glad you guys don't know this guy. No, oh, drat. <laughs> okay, so in Georgia, they put a guy on their science, space, and technology committee who says that evolution, embryology, and Big Bang cosmology are lies from the pit of hell. And we took a science-denying young earth creationist from Texas and put him in charge of NASA. A search of the many laughable quotations from any of the idiotic ideologues in power in my country will convince you that, or will prove, that my country has been reduced to an idiocracy. The people we put in charge not only do not know what they're talking about, they don't even believe in it. They have no education or understanding in any of the matters over which they preside, and they're not relying on the, on the advice of experts either. In matter of fact, they brag that they have to stand up to the experts. And this is a reference to the former chairman of our Board of Education when the testimony of several dozen scientific specialists was collectively ignored and rejected by a willfully ignorant dentist. And that same dentist also teaches at a Christian school where he told his, his uh, congregation of fourth graders to keep chipping away at that empirical evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Illustrating that it's not about what's understand, you know, understanding what is really true, but believing what you want to believe, even when you know it's not really true. A year or so ago, te the Texas Republican Party platform actually said that they are against critical thinking. That they are opposed to higher order thinking skills which might challenge or might uh, challenge a student's fixed beliefs. And I don't think students should have fixed beliefs. The very idea of that is wrong. Because it not only goes against science, it also goes against the purpose of education. The only way to improve your understanding is to seek out the flaws in your current perception and correct them. And you can't do that if you already imagine that you have the absolute truth and you insist that no amount of proof will ever prove you wrong. But that is the nature of faith. Faith is an assertion of unreasonable conviction that is assumed without reason and defended against all reason. Instilling faith is the purpose of religious teaching, but it uh, is also used to instill right-wing conservative politics, too. In places like Texas, where lessons in science, sex, and social studies are censored or distorted by religious influence, the contest is not, uh, the contest is not just over what students may know, but what they may believe. 
It's treated like a struggle over their soul. And the only way to be saved is to be convinced of things that are unsupportable or indefensible or have already been proven false. Whenever anyone adopts, adopts a religious doctrine, it's usually the one that they were trained in as a child, uh, before they were old enough to raise the eyebrow of analytical scrutiny. Because it takes a special kind of adult mind to walk into an unfamiliar religion and still find it credible somehow, unless of course you ignore or fail to explore all the details and only accept the vague general notions unexamined, which I'm sorry to say is what Christians typically do. If you want people to know the whole doctrine and still believe it and swallow it all as a package deal, uh, despite all the obvious absurdities, atrocities, inconsistencies, and contradictions, then your only option will be either to beguile the ignorant or the innocent. Because you have to convince those who literally don't know any better. You're going to have to package your propaganda in a very misleading way um, in hopes of confusing the undereducated, or you're going to have to imprint it on very young children before they reach the age of reason, which is typically said to be seven or eight years old. And it must be done thoroughly and systematically, always asserting complete conviction while prohibiting any curious inquiry which might throw the entire baseless bit of baseless speculation into question. This has been a concentrated effort in the United States for more than a hundred years. William Jennings Bryan was a prosecuting attorney at the Scopes Monkey Trial of 1925 when it was illegal to teach evolution in school. Bryan was also a presidential candidate and he summarized the point, position of the religious right when he said, the parents have a right to say that no teacher paid by their money shall rob their children of faith in God and send them back to their homes skeptical or infidels, or agnostics, or atheists. And by the way, the way I would define that, the last three of those categories are all one and the same thing. If anybody identifies as an agnostic, almost certainly they're actually atheists, they just don't realize it. Help them along with that. <laughs> uh, William Jennings Bryan also said, if we have to give up either religion or education, we should give up education. And this should help you understand that in the mindset of religious extremists, whether you believe it matters more than whether it is true. Creationism is a form of religious extremism, and it is critical to fundamentalists that students believe in the sacred fables and not understand or even know about the actual facts of the matter, which cannot be evaluated honestly, but instead must be distorted or perverted or concealed. <laughs> Several years ago, I had a, a moderated online debate with a pair of evangelical ministers who had close relations with our State Board of Education. And I naively believed that once I show them clearly and prove the mistakes that they were trying to, uh, to present in class, that they would honestly concede and not try to push those particular falsehoods. But they surprised me by shamelessly admitting that they were lying and that they knew it, but that that didn't matter. One of these people said, for example, that he knew that there were transitional species in the fossil record, but that he wanted to teach students that there were none, because he said, it's important that they believe that there are none. Um, so we're dealing with a position that has neither honesty, nor credibility, nor accountability, where the ends justify the means, and where it doesn't matter what the facts are, because it doesn't matter what the truth is. All that matters is whether they can make people believe a required conclusion with no demonstrable truth in it. For preschool kids, that process starts at home. Various organizations have published many different videos and activity books designed to build faith. And that is exactly the opposite of their being able to examine something critically or think about it logically. In this case, it means to completely convince the kids that Jesus' magic and devils and damnation is real, and that everyone believes it, and that you better believe it, or else. 
They promise an impossible prize that they'll never have to pay up because it's not going to be paid until after you die. And this is weighed against the threat of a fate worse than death who all, for all of those who can still doubt, who have some power of reason. Uh, the only rewards are for those gullible enough to believe, and that is the ultimate criteria for redemption. It is a very powerful method of mind control, and adults who manage to come away from this type of indoctrination have reported nightmares from a lifetime of forced conformity and systematic inculcation. Then when kids are old enough to uh, go to school, the parents have a choice. Those who can stay home with the kids may choose to homeschool them to keep them away from the world and all its evil influences. They actually talk like that, like there's the things of the world and all of that is bad. And that they are not of the world and they need to keep themselves separate and stay out of it and live in a bubble of dreamlike <coughs> nonsense like strawberry fields where nothing is real. And most of these parents homeschool so they can teach their religion and keep their kids from learning about evolution. And many the, there's so many <coughs> parents doing this that the keynote speaker at a convention of homeschool parents was Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis <laughs> Ministries. That and there are textbooks designed to be used by homeschool parents who are specifically interested in promoting creationism. For example, the Abeka Creationism textbook lists among its chapters a matter of origins. It pretends that there are conflicting views of geologic history and claims to give evidence of a global flood when the entirety of mainstream geology insists that there is no such evidence. And uh, the next chapter is Lie True because it talks about the lack of intermediate fossils in the fossil record regardless how many hundreds of them we actually have and it pretends to present evidence against evolution, which they call a mistaken belief. So this is systematically lying to children. I can find no justification in this. And it's not like they don't know. It's not like they have a right to believe something that they might be correct about. They know they're wrong. And it's when they say believe, put the word make and a hyphen right in front of that because make believe is actually what it is and I'm being completely serious about this. One of the reasons that I feel that I can be so confident in making that statement is when someone tells me that they can prove that I'm wrong, I'm all ears. Let me hear your argument. It will end up being ridiculous, I suspect, because I've been doing this for decades and it always is. But when I tell them that I can prove this point, fingers and ears, they already know that I can really do it. And they already, they already tell, they tell me things like, why can't I believe what I want to believe? Meaning that they already suspect that what they believe is not actually true. So understand that kids who are educated this way are repeatedly taught all the wrongest arguments against science and the worst misrepresentations of science that you've ever heard, but they don't know how wrong they are because that's all they've ever heard. And it calls to mind the old Nazi quote that if you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it, especially if it's a big lie. But that's only frustrating if you think that people shouldn't be lied to. If you think that deceiving and misleading innocent children is wrong, then you're going to have a problem with creationism. If you think it's okay to lie, if you're lying for Jesus, then you're probably a creationist. But whatever your position, understand this. It is not possible to defend creationism honestly. There is no evidence to indicate creation, and all of the arguments contrived against evolution are erroneous. In fact, they're so bad that the only way they can be convincing is if you only hear that one side and you don't have an adequate understanding of science. So what about the people who can't stay home with their kids and have to send them to public school? Ironically, they're not going to learn evolution either. It's a matter of established fact and a fundamental aspect of biology, but most people won't teach it. It's usually skipped over. Why? <laughs> because it's rare to find a science teacher who understands evolution well enough to teach it. And uh, if they do, they're not likely to teach it properly because some evangelical ministries have actually trained kids on how to disrupt the class when they hear certain keywords. 
They'll either throw out snippets of all kinds of anti-science apologetics in every possible field, which no teacher could possibly know enough about for being able to refute everything, or if it's concerning anything that has to do with millions of years, the teachers may ask the state or the students may ask the teacher, "Were you there?" <laughs> because that's what their ministers have trained them to say. In science, arguments from authority are worthless. An eyewitness testimony is the least reliable form of evidence. But creationists believe in the authority of Scripture, and they say that an eyewitness is always better than evidence or math. This is why I say you put the make dash in front of believe. Uh, they don't ask whether the Bible authors were there, because they assume that the Bible was written by God, and that it is, uh, therefore counts as an eyewitness account, even though the text of the Bible proves that it couldn't possibly be. If any teacher tries to teach evolution and isn't interrupted by the students, they're likely to get a backlash from parents and administrators. In many schools across Texas, if a science teacher is outed as an atheist, their job is at risk. And we have at least one publicized case of a teacher being fired for promoting evolution, or more specifically, for not pretending that creationism had equal credence in science. <coughs> so even though evolution is part of the required curricula, uh, most teachers wouldn't teach it if they knew how, and of course most of them don't. And as if that was, um, let me see, bear with me just a second. Yeah. And uh, as if that wasn't bad enough, in Texas as in many other states, and not just in the South, roughly 20% of our science teachers are creationists and not only don't understand evolution and would not teach it properly but in many cases they will ignore the law and ethics and teach creationism instead. Uh, after Edwards versus Aguilar in 1987 it became illegal to teach creationism in public school but several states have since created laws to find ways around that. So we now see that there are thousands of schools using public funds to teach biblical creationism as if it could be really true. Point of fact, every testable claim that creationism makes has already been proven wrong. There is no question about that. But again, this is deliberately deceiving other students. And this is going on right now in Louisiana, Arizona, Arkansas, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Indiana, Ohio, Oklahoma, Utah, Washington, Wisconsin, Tennessee, and Texas. <coughs> there are now legal provisions protecting creationist teachers. And two states have somehow found a way to make creationism legal to teach again, despite the fact that it remains an unconstitutional endorsement of religion which fails all three prongs of the Lemon Test. The case of Lemon versus Kurtzman in 1971 established three ways to determine whether a law violates the First Amendment with regard to the separation of church and state. First, the statute must have a secular legislative purpose, which is, of course, uh, impossible uh, when you're teaching fables as fact. That's just a promotion of religion for no good reason. Second, the principle or primary effect of the law must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion. But of course, creationism violates both of those because it promotes certain brands of Western Abrahamic monotheism and discourages all other types of religious belief. And finally, the statute must not foster an excessive government entanglement with, re entanglement with religion, which is inevitable when government-funded schools are citing mythology as an authority over science. A couple of years ago, a young boy asked our governor, Rick Perry, how old the world was. Perry pretended that no one knows how old the world is, and then he said that evolution was just a theory that was full of holes, and that in Texas, we teach both evolution and creation. And a bunch of representatives scrambled to try to correct his gaffe, and we all made fun of him for not knowing any better. But it turned out he was right. What Perry knew that the rest of us hadn't yet figured out was that uh, there was a, a loophole 
uh, created without any public notice. House Bill 1287, which was uh, passed in, in 2007, initially said that schools may offer an elective course in the history and literature of the Old Testament era as compared to the New Testament era. And Christians forgot entirely that it was supposed to be about the history of the era. And they also objected to the Bible being referred to as literature. But once the law was passed, they changed the wording so that may offer became shall offer. And it was no longer an elective. It became mandatory Bible study across the state. Mark Chansey, professor of religious studies at Southwestern or Southern Methodist University, compiled a detailed report on how the bill was implemented across the state. He found that only three of those districts taught the course in a legally and academically sound, academically sound manner that was respectful toward the biblical material and to the diverse sensibilities of the students. The other 22 uh, courses all assumed or encouraged religious views specific to Protestant Christianity, thus prompting one faith perspective over any other. The House Public Education Committee also required that the State Board of Education impose standards on biblical instruction and to make additional materials available. So since the heavily creationist State Board of Education had become involved, where do you think these additional materials came from? Despite recommendations from the prior committee, the Board of Education allowed broadly defined parameters rather than context-specific standards, and teachers were neither given instruction nor direction, and a few that, uh, that did get were only uh, granted a one-day session in which to contrast the Old Testament versus the New Testament. And of course, most believers failed in this contrast because they saw the entire book as one long fulfilled prophecy. And since the teachers didn't know what they were talking about and weren't going to be trained in it, they had to get special teachers who already had training. And so a lot of these teachers turned out to be ministers. <coughs> and uh, two of them had advanced, advanced degrees in Bible study, and their courses contained numerous elements that federal courts had already ruled or identified as unconstitutional. In all these courses, factual inaccuracies were reportedly frequent, uh, whether through innocence or ignorance, lacking any specific education, or through deliberate intent. And we've already seen there are many examples of that that I haven't gone into the list about. A fair number of these courses were reportedly as blatantly and thoroughly sectarian, presenting religious views as fact, and explicitly encouraging students to adopt these views. In each and every case where a course promotes religious views, the views in question are conservative, Protestant, Christian. Uh, and some of the districts stayed exclusively with the approved materials, and those that did had fewer problems than others. Other districts relied on books and videos that were provided by ministries which expressed the intent of converting non-believers and strengthening faith. The movies shown to ninth grade students included Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments, The Passion of the Christ, <laughs> and left behind with Kirk Cameron. <laughs> Several districts endorse, favor, or promote specific religious beliefs by suggesting flat out that the Bible was dictated by God and was thus free from any factual or historic error. The report says that presenting such views as if they are factually accurate blatantly crosses the legal threshold. Some of the districts were supplied by the National Council of Bible Curriculum and Public Schools, and that source cites a book called Signature of God. The cover promises documented evidence that proves beyond doubt that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. And another of their books is Secrets of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which concludes, There are many secrets that have yet to be searched out from among the scrolls, but there is no secret to a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus the Messiah. The only resource submitted by Lasbuddy Independent School District is a Journal of a Lifetime, which is a 52-lesson study of the entire Bible by Oklahoma minister Tommy C. Higgle, and it includes tips for your personal study. In its introduction it says, pray for God's guidance before each lesson, and don't worry about the passages you don't understand. 
Simply concentrate on what God reveals to you and let and trust in Him to make the vague, seem, vague things seem clearer as you continue to study. And this book also includes a section on how to receive salvation. So at least the students are learning something. <laughs> Gene Taylor's The Gospel of John, Evidences for Evidences, I love the way they do this, for Belief, 2005, used by Dayton Independent School District, and this is one of the worst ones in the report, makes its purpose clear in the preface. May this study be of value to you. May you fully come to believe that Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, and may you have life in His name. So what exactly have kids been learning in our supposedly secular schools all these years that we didn't know was going on? A PowerPoint slide in Brenham Independent School District emphasizes Christ's resurrection was an event that occurred in time and space that was a reality, historical, and not mythological. Eastland Independent School District videos uh, shows videos produced by Creation Evidence Museum. And if you're not familiar with them, uh, this, uh, this was run by a charlatan who uh, created a bogus college in order to award a doctorate to himself. Uh, Dr. Carl Baugh is so disreputable that even other creationists call him a fraud on a level with P.T. Barnum. He is most famous for forging human footprints and making it look like dinosaurs had walked along with human beings 6,000 years ago in 6,000-year-old Cretaceous strata. And these fraudulent footprints are now being presented as fact in our classrooms as part of the Texas curriculum. Students in the Point Isabel Independent School District course spent two days watching what lesson plans describe as the historic documentary of ancient aliens. Which presents a view of in, or a new interpretation of angelic beings described as extraterrestrials. Students were then asked to write a small paragraph on how valid they think the alien theory is. This has been going on in our schools since 2007. <coughs> Ector County's Permian High School, and this is where my wife is from, sad to say, uh, that makes this claim, sad to say, mainstream anti God media portray these true facts in the light of, or excuse me, sad to say, main, mainstream anti God media portray these true facts in the light of faith, but prefer to skeptically doubt such archaeological proofs of the veracity and historicity of the biblical account as one of the most accurate history books in the history of the world. <laughs> Test questions include, explain what happens in Genesis 1.1 and 1.2 according to the gap theory. And the answer makes no attempt to explain the contradictions between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. We're only talking about the first two lines out of Genesis 1. Um, one intended answer is that Yahweh threw Satan and one-third of the angels out of heaven uh, down to the first earth. I don't remember any line out of the Bible that mentions how many earths there are. But one thing I did notice is that between those two lines, there's no way you can assume all of that stuff. Uh, it, but I have noticed a trend where creationists kind of do their, or their, their interpretation by reading between the lines and then just kind of ignoring the lines. <laughs> uh, one from an old Dallas High School Bible course textbook says, What is the strongest evidence of the Bible's divine origin? And the intended answer reads, The greatest evidence of the Bible's divine origin is fulfilled prophecy. A quiz in the Huntsville Independent School District course reads, how might the Passover be a sign foreshadowing Christ? There are very few Jews in Texas. And little wonder, right? Because they have to sit here and listen to how Judaism foreshadows Christ. How disrespectful is that for non-Christian students in your classroom? There's no allowance of diversity under this system. The same sectarian approach is advanced in presentations in other part of the Tanakh, 
or Jewish Bible, and Amarillo Independent School District test Genesis uh, through Nehemiah and ask questions like, which prophet foretold that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem? And who foretold that a virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son? And if you've ever read that prophecy, it's obvious that they're talking about a kid who lived and died centuries before Jesus. This is no way that they're talking about Jesus here. But again, just ignore all those other lines. Several districts tried to construct a history timeline confidently conjuring conflicting dates from one version to another. Uh, Boys Ranch Independent School District has Moses writing Genesis around 1500 BC, while Refugio ISD has Moses composing Deuteronomy over a hundred years later in the year 1406. How did they come up with that date? <laughs> <laughs> There is a bit of traditional bigotry in these courses, too, especially anti-Jewish sentiment. Amarillo's course materials included a chart titled, Racial Origins Traced Through Noah, and uses modern racial and national terminology to identify the ancient tribes mentioned in the text as descendants of Noah's sons. According to this chart, Western Europeans and Caucasians, as if there's a difference there, uh, descend from Japheth. African tribes and Canaanites from Ham, Semitic and Oriental beams from Shem. <coughs> An Amarillo chart outlines all the ways in which Hebrews suggest that Jesus is superior to Judaism, and according to this report, the endorsement goes beyond what the scripture says. Other courses depict Judaism and in particular Jewish sects in the time of Jesus as legalistic, hypocritical, and spiritually empty. Longview ISD speaks uh, appreciatively of the monotheism and moral and ceremonial uh, purity of the Pharisees and then categorically, <coughs> categorically denounces them by saying that Jesus exposed their hypocrisy and self-righteousness. The book used at Lasbuddy ISD says that thousands of Orthodox Jews still today earnestly anticipate the coming of the Messiah and after the church is gone from the earth, God will take the veil from many of their eyes and they will embrace Jesus Christ as the true Messiah. Regardless whether you have Jewish or Muslim students in your classroom. However, students in the Eastland course learn to prepare traditional hamantashem uh, for Purim. They look at latka recipes for Hanukkah. They sing and dance the Hava Nagila. They meet a Holocaust survivor and they visit the Dallas Holocaust Museum, but they also get a handout commemorating the uh, destruction of the two Jewish temples, and that handout ends with the proclamation, Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. And as might be expected, there is also a distortion of American history. Belton ISD uses a religious tract called One Nation Under God, it begins by saying that the United States was founded on the principles of liberty of the Holy Bible and the reverence of the Founding Fathers. To support this, the track quotes from William Penn, John Quincy Adams, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Benjamin Franklin, and uh, excerpts from prose like the Pledge of Allegiance, <coughs> which of course was doctored many decades after it was originally written so that under God could be submitted in there. It concludes, uh, giving God his rightful place in the national life of this country has provided a rich heritage for all its citizens, yet as wonderful as the benefits of that heritage may be, a true relationship with God is not a matter of national declaration, but rather a personal responsibility of each individual citizen. And then it asks, would you like to place your trust in Jesus Christ and receive him as your Savior from sin? Remember that these are state-funded, tax-supported, supposedly secular schools. <laughs> Another Belton ISD resource titled Timely Words About God's Timeless Word consists entirely of favorable quotes from various figures about the Bible, and students are then tested on their ability to match the quote with the speaker. And the problem is that the authors couldn't seem to do that because the person who compiled this report identified many of those quotes as spurious. Uh, the author of this report also provides an equivalent list of authentic quotes from some of the same people. Yeah, it wasn't supposed to change. 
because uh, I'm reading off from this report for a little bit. But the author of this report gives an equivalent list of authentic quotes from some of these same people previously mentioned, but making the opposite points. And uh, he also included a reference from the firstamendmentcenter.org to outline exactly what the boundaries of this type of Bible study were supposed to be. The school's approach to religion is academic, not devotional. Failed. The schools may strive for students' awareness of religion, but should not press for acceptance of any religion, which of course they failed. The school may sponsor study about religion, but may not sponsor the practice of religion, which of course they failed. The school may expose students to a diversity of religious views, which they failed to do, but may not impose, discourage, or encourage any particular view. Again, the school may educate about religion, but may not promote or denigrate any religion, which of course they did both. And the school may inform the student about various religious beliefs, but should not conform him or her to a particular belief. I'd like to remind you that the people, or the guy that, that compiled this report is himself a Christian. But, uh, he said, there is no reason why students cannot learn about the historically influential interpretations or doctrines, e.g. the Trinity, the Fall, the Serpent as Satan, in the name of cultural literacy. But, those interpretations should be presented as the products of interpretive practices and traditions of particular religious communities, not as universal and self-evident readings. Politicized religious extremism doesn't just want to control your children to mislead and deceive them. It also wants to deprive you of your rights as parents. And this may be best demonstrated by the good news clubs that have sprung up all over the country. And these groups use school grounds for fun after-school activities, which is the way they're advertised, to the kids, not to the parents. They invite the kids to these events while they're still at school without notifying the parents, because what they're actually doing is full-tilt evangelizing to very young children, preferably below seven years old, without parental consent or regardless of parental consent, and very often without their knowledge. If you just want your kids to be taught actual, factual information, if religion has any influence over that, it's not going to happen. And we're not just talking about science. <laughs> Instead of offering sex education and teaching about birth control, Texas policy is to teach abstinence only. And this policy has been such a colossal failure that we now have the highest, the nation's highest rate of repeat teen pregnancies. <coughs> and we've seen a 47% increase in the children living below the poverty level in the years since this policy was implemented. If it wasn't already bad enough, they've also closed Planned Parenthood and canceled many of the, of the programs that would have been a benefit to poor children and unwed mothers creating a negative feedback loop so with uh, predictably inevitable results so that everything just keeps getting worse. The Texas State Board of Education has also effectively whitewashed our history uh, by removing all mention of any wrongs our country has done and by eliminating or diminishing all ethnic <coughs> influence so that it now seems as if every one of our historic heroes <coughs> was a white Protestant Christian man. And that America has always been a shining example of uh, blessed by God where slavery <coughs> was never even mentioned. They removed that and found another word so they wouldn't have to admit that America once had slaves. In recent months our history books have also been changed again this time to treat the Bible like a history book. Uh, the one textbook that uh, described Africans as the descendants of Ham, son of Noah. And the textbook that my state adopted uh, said that the U.S. Constitution was inspired by a covenant between God and Moses. Despite the fact that um, <laughs> 
the textbook actually treats Moses as a person who definitely existed and was a historic figure. And I tested before the State Board of Education that we can prove that the Constitution was not based on the Ten Commandments and that Moses was no more a historic figure than Robin Hood or King Arthur. I was not popular in that room. <laughs> uh, and my testimony and the testimony of dozens of professional teachers and scientists were collectively ignored. Behind closed doors, they chose to adopt books that they knew were wrong because everybody told them so. And so the result being that our history has been deliberately and deceptively it's distorted according to the agenda of the religious right in order to instill racism, nationalism, and dominionism as well as forcing belief in dubious mythology. All this without even mentioning allegations of some religious orphanages and schools abusing, molesting, or murdering children. We're just talking about what typically happens whenever religion gets into the classroom, <coughs> regardless of regulation or restrictions. So in closing, how religion harms education is every way that it possibly can. I would think that I'm not telling anything new to people who live in a place where every school is a Christian school. So when they ask me to speak on this subject, <laughs> you already know, right? So I can only come from a Texas perspective. That's what we put up with. I'm ready to hear what you guys did. Thank you. <laughs>